Well, good morning. Good to see you. I trust all of you are doing good. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm trusting and praying you're warm and dry and everything's great. And I hope you have the family gathered around the TV. And I want you to share and like the video. Let people know that we're preaching the gospel this morning. And they can join New Light Church if they're not having their church and are not able to watch on Facebook. Have them to join with us this morning. I want you to know your kids can go to Anchor Kids church Facebook page and there'll be a live video there for them teaching. I'd encourage you to have your kids to go there and be a part of that as well. If you're interested in giving your tithes, offerings, or mission pledges, you can do that on our app. You can do it on our website. There's a place there that you can give. And so make sure you do that. And I want to remind you that today is the last day or we start the last week of our 21 day fast today. And uh, I want you to really dig in and be a part of uh, what we're doing. If you haven't been on the fast with us, it's not too late. You can join us this last week. And when I say that and I talk about giving and I talk about the fast, we want to maybe understand why we pray and why we fast and why we give. It would be a good time for me to talk about that just a little bit. Well, I want to tell you something that we've had a phenomenal year here at New Light Church. And we're watching people who are uh, giving their hearts to the Lord every week, two or three people every single week rededicating their heart to the Lord and being born again. And a lot of them are join, joining ministry teams and becoming a part of the great ministry here at New Light Church. And in fact, when I say that, I want to remind you that there's a Church 101 class coming up. It's with our Connections Ministry. Pastor Corey Nance is heading that up. And uh, you can uh, contact him and get some information about that. And if you want to learn more about New Light Church, it'd be a great time to do that. And so when we come together and we give and we pray and we fast, we can reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just to show you how all that works together, we take a minute just to kind of look at this past year. And, and while it was a difficult year and there were some uh, tragic things that happened throughout our congregation, I want you to know that NLC had its biggest year this year that it's ever had in its history. And this church is about 90 plus years old. And so we had our biggest year uh, in 21. When you look at it, financially it was the biggest year and spiritually it's the biggest year and, and doing ministry it was the biggest year. We had, we had a great year and I thank God so much for it. And I thank you as the, as the body of Christ here at New Light Church for being a part of that. So what I'm asking you to do, this last week of this fast, we need to reach more people this year. We need to be able to do more ministry. We want certainly more people saved. And I want God to give us insight to how we can make inroads into this community and reach the community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want God to bless you. And I want God to give you the desires of your heart. And I want to be a better pastor. I want the church to do better ministry and more ministry. So this last week of the fast, I want you to really dig in. And I want you to pray for the ministry. I want you to pray for your pastor. I want you to pray for each other. And I, I want you to pray and ask God to do what needs to be done in your life. It's a great opportunity for us to dig in and give God our best this last week of this 21-day fast. Before I preach today, I want to talk about the Impact Ministry. It's a student ministry. Uh, and we were uh, kind of organizing it at the end of this past year. And we, we've kind of perfected some things about it. So our first meeting this year will be January 23rd. It'll be at my home, and I'm telling you, it's going to be a great, great event. We're going to have a bonfire outside, and we're going to have games, and we're going to have food. It's going to be a great time, and if, whether you go to this church or not, you're invited. If you're a student, uh, maybe a high schooler or first-year college, and you want somewhere to go January the 23rd, it'll be a fun time, and you can be sure that the Word of the Lord is going to be taught there, and I believe that the God, and I'm praying that God will break out a revival among our student ministry, our teenagers, and our first-year college folks. And so I want to invite you to be a part of that. And parents, I'm telling you that because I want you to encourage your kids to come. And I think it'll be a blessing to them. And, I, and we have some great plans for some uh, local missions work, maybe even some foreign mission trips, different things like that. So we're building this ministry. Don and I are having a great time with it, and we want you to be a part of it. So whether you come to this church or not, if you need somewhere to go and you're in that age group, make sure you mark your calendar and be a part of what's happening there. It'll be a fun time. So 
Let's get into the series. We're in a current series, and it's called uh, Back to the Basics. And boy, it's been a fun series to preach. And um, we have really been, our eyes have been opened quite a bit to some things that God desires for us to know. And, and we're talking about really things, basic things that should be a part of every Christian's life. And um, so I want to continue that. I'll remind you that we have preached the first uh, sermon was about prayer. And we learned that God, it's God's will that we pray. And God loves for us to come into his throne room boldly. He loves bold prayers. And then last week we talked about the word of God. And we learned that the word of the Lord feeds us, frees us, and forms us. And so the word of God is so important in our life. And so with that said, I want to get into the day's sermon. And it's a good one, I think. Not because I'm preaching it, but because I think God really wants to speak to us today. I want to talk about confession and repentance. I didn't want to talk about one without the other because I think they both go hand in hand. And throughout the scripture, we see in some, uh, some of the books that we read in the books of the Bible, we read the word confession and some we read the word repentance. And I'm not real sure, to be honest with you, why the different words were used. They kind of seem to mean the same thing or lead to the same thing. Uh, but, but different writers use different words. And I guess maybe as God spoke and the Holy Spirit spoke to these writers, uh, some of them, God used their own vocabulary and their own personalities, and some chose the word confession while some chose the word repentance, I guess. And I'm not sure if that's right, but that's my conclusion to this point until God shows me something different. So uh, you'll find the word confession and repentance throughout Scripture. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. The word confession simply means that we are to acknowledge our sin. Now, I, I want to tell you that Christian people, we have been forgiven, no question about that, and, and we are in right relationship with God, but the truth is we sin and fall short of the glory of God. Oftentimes we do. We miss the mark a lot of times. So uh, in the Scripture, it tells us to confess our sin. That simply means to acknowledge our sin. Now, I just want to address that word just a little bit. You have to be careful about this because I think sometimes when we approach God and we acknowledge our sin, we, we don't get specific enough about our sin. I think that a lot of times we get a little bit relaxed in this area, and I don't think God appreciates that too much because what I think God meant when he said, confess your sin, he simply meant this. He, he meant for us to specifically acknowledge what was happening in our life, take responsibility for it, realize that we're on a wrong course, admit to God that we have this particular sin in our life and deal with it. Now, when you think about that and you get to the word repentance, it means something a little bit different. And it's interesting, again, why the scripture uses two different words. Repentance means change your mind. In other words, I think it goes a step further than that when it says change your mind. I think, it, I think God was saying you ought to have a made-up mind about some things. In other words, that when you serve me, your mind ought to be made up that uh, that uh, you serve the Lord and you're a child of God and what my word says is right and you accept that. So when you look at the word repentance, it really means uh, to change your mind. And what God is saying is I want you to change your mind about me and who I am and I want you to change your mind about sin and about self and life and living. And I just want you to have my perspective on things with what God says. So uh, there are two words. We're going to deal with those words interchangeably, although they mean something a little bit different. Throughout this sermon, we'll deal with both of those. So 1 John kind of says this. Uh, it says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Now, let me just talk about that for a moment. There's a big difference in having a, uh, um, a life that we live, um, the way we live our life, a lifestyle. There's a big difference in a lifestyle than, than, and, than making a mistake or finding yourself in a vulnerable, vulnerable position and making a wrong choice. You can do that. We're all human beings and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to find ourselves in position sometimes and somebody's going to push our button the wrong way and we're going to respond and react and God understands that and we have this flesh, this human nature, and the sin nature that we have to be careful about. And, 
And so we're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short of the glory of God. But there's a big difference in that and living a lifestyle. So here's what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, in the body of Christ, we have to be careful not to embrace a lifestyle that is contrary to the word of the Lord because we don't live in darkness anymore. We should be living in the light. We should do our best, our very best to live like God says we ought to live, be who God says we, we are, and we ought to honor him in everything in our life. But we are going to make mistakes. So we don't live in darkness anymore uh, and, uh, because we're, but if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, there it is, so clear in scripture. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Now, we can't claim that we don't have any sin because the truth of the matter, we do have sin in our life. We never can live up to the standard that God has called us to live up to. We are continually trying to get there. However, that does, doesn't justify you and I living in sin and continuing to stay there. There's a way that we deal with sin, and it's called confession and repentance. It's called acknowledging specifically what's happening in our life, and it's called changing our mind about that and making our mind up that we're going to serve God. It's what we're teaching today. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have no sin or we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has not no place in our hearts. Now that's just as clear as it can be there. So God is telling us that we are to confess our sin. And again, we're not to be kind of relaxed about that. I mean, we can go to God and say, well, God, I've sinned against you today. Would you please forgive me? I think that's a little bit relaxed. I think really what the intent of God was is we get right down to the core of what's happening in our life. And we say to God, God, you know, I have this pride in my heart. I know it's wrong, and I'm supposed to have a heart of humility. Would you forgive me of that pride? I, I know you don't want it in my life. It's contrary to your word. I'm your child. God, take the pride out. If it's fear, if it's anger, if it's unforgiveness, whatever it could be in your life, be specific with God. Take it to him. Acknowledge that you have it. Repent of it. Change your mind about it and don't do it anymore. Too often in the body of Christ, we will acknowledge it, maybe not as specific as we should, and we will, uh, we will do that, but we don't change our mind about it because it continues to be a part of our life. And God never intended for it to be that way. He intended for us to acknowledge it, deal with it, put it behind us and change and move on and be like him. Matthew 3 and 2 uses the other word, repent here. It says, repent for your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the first time the word repent, and it means change your mind. It's mentioned, and it's mentioned by John the Baptist. He, he was the one that said the word there. And uh, he was talking to the people who were Jewish people. They were in the religion of Judaism, and they believed in the Mosaic law and the legalistic part of the law and the sacrifices and all that stuff. And John was simply saying to them, it's time for you to change your mind about law and grace. It would be nice if the church now would change their mind about law and grace. Any law, anything out there because we live under grace now. And so John was saying, hey, it's time for you to change your mind about law and grace. Embrace the grace of God. Leave the law alone because grace is better than law. And then Jesus uses the same word. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven it's near. That was Jesus was talking. He used the word repentance. And he's talking about changing your mind again. And take it a step further. Have a made up mind. And he's also addressing the fact, choose grace over law. And the church today ought to always choose grace over law. And so Jesus has come. He's fulfilled all that needed to be done to satisfy God. We're under grace and not law anymore. So I want to deal with with the confession and the repentance thing all the way through this scripture. I want to give you three benefits uh, for confessing and repenting. And I want you to think today about this. I want you to know that today that the words confession and repentance are really good words. They're not bad words. And there should be no condemnation with those words. And there should not be these feelings or thoughts that you're unworthy or 
that you shouldn't be able to, or you shouldn't be coming to God again, and this shouldn't be a part of your life. Sure, it shouldn't be a part of your life, but understand that God has made it very clear already in Scripture that you and I are going to fall short of His glory, but thank God He's given us these two words called confession and repentance, so when we do fall short of His glory, we can run to Him, and He'll take care of it. He'll make things right in our life, and we can live the life that God has called us to live. So three things I want to talk to you about when it concerns uh, these two words, the, the benefits of them. Number one, it, when we confess and repent, we are immediately forgiven by God. Immediately forgiven. There's no delay in this. It happens right away when we confess it and we acknowledge it before God. When we repent and change our mind and we have a made up mind, then we are immediately forgiven. Now that's something we all ought to shout about and that's something we all ought to be happy about. And, and so because God has made a way. And so Psalms chapter 32 really deals with this and I'll go into this Psalm a little bit more because it was a Psalm of David and David has an interesting perspective on this because he had something interesting going on when this was written. I'll talk about that in the next point because I'm going to use some more scriptures in this psalm and I'll give you the words about that. But here's what he said. Finally, finally, in other words, he waited. Now think about this. He waited for some time apparently before he confessed and, and he was getting himself spiritual in a place he didn't need to. But he says, finally... I confessed all my sin to you, he's talking about God, and stop trying to hide my guilt. Now stop right there. You and I ought to see something here. David apparently concealed his, uh, his sin for some time. He didn't acknowledge, he didn't repent of it, he didn't change his mind about it. He hid it for some time. But he comes to this place where he's eaten up with guilt. And I'm afraid that a lot of us are coming to church. We're Christians. We're trying to serve the Lord. We're trying to operate like God says we ought to operate, be who God has called us to be. But we have not confessed some sins that are in our life. And here's the reality of that. We're living under this tremendous guilt. And when you think about guilt, it's condemnation. And we live under that condemnation and guilt and we give the devil a foothold in our life because we have unconfessed sin in our life. We give him a foothold and what the devil does with that, he just destroys us spiritually with that. And I've just come to say to some of you today, be like David and finally come to a place where you confess your sin, you repent of your sin, you change your mind about it, you admit it specifically to God, whatever it was, you tell God you know it's wrong, you don't want to be that way, then you change your mind and say, I'm not going to be that way, and you make your mind up that you're going to follow God, and you're going to do it God's way, and you're going to trust God to help you with that thing. Finally, David does that, and the guarantee when he did that was the guilt was gone, and the same thing can happen in your life. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion. See how he names it specifically? To the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see there. And you forgave me, all my guilt is gone. Boy, that's a great place to be. Here's what he just said. He said, I specifically named my sin. I confessed it and I, I repented about that. I changed my mind about it. I confessed it to the Lord because here's the reality. Every time we sin, while we may sin against a person, the bigger thing we do is we sin against God. And then David said, you know, he didn't talk about who he sinned with or what he did in his specific sin to other people. What he just simply said is, I rebelled against God. And that covered everything that he did. He was specific about that. But the greater thing is, he admitted that the sin was against God and not man. Yes, we sin against man, but the bigger one that we sin against is God. So if you're going to have your guilt erased and gone, and you're going to have the condemnation gone, and you're going to get the devil off your back, you got to get specific with God. you got to realize you're sinning against him before you're sinning against man. Make it right with God, and God will remove the guilt and the condemnation. David is very clear about that. Watch what Psalms has to say about this. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Now that is the word of the Lord. And here's what we see God saying. You're not going to prosper. You're not going to grow spiritually. You're not going to advance. God's favor is not going to be on your life. 
God's not going to be working for you. God's not going to be leading your paths. He's not going to be calling your steps. He's not going to be opening doors. In other words, you're not going to prosper uh, the way God desires for you to prosper. If you conceal the sin in your life. Uh, it's very clear here in this scripture. So when you think about that, you think, well, you know, this is so good, preacher. I don't have to live under guilt. I don't have to live under condemnation. I don't have to give the devil a foothold in my life. Why in the world is it like that? I'll tell you why it's like that. We are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus, what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. By God sending his son to die on the cross and to die for you and I, he paid the sin debt for every one of us, past, present, and future. And he gave his blood, shed his blood for every one of us. And the Bible says because he did that, that you and I have everything we need for life and godliness. And here's what that simply means. That simply means if I anchor my faith and I trust what Jesus did and I just hold it right there and I say that is enough, God finished it, it was done, Jesus did all the work, then that releases the Holy Spirit to come into my life and do the work that needs to be done in my life. Therefore, when I fall short of the glory of God, when I miss the mark, when I sin, I can go to God and I can pray and I can acknowledge that sin. I can repent about that sin and the Holy Spirit runs and he removes the guilt in my life. He, he does a transformation again and I'm right back in the presence of God on the right track automatically because of what Jesus did it across the Calvary. Ephesians explains it this way, and I think it'll help us understand. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding, all because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Let me tell you, because Jesus shed his blood, God will always forgive you. Because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he purchased you. You are a son of God, and because you place your faith in what Jesus Christ did, God is quick to forgive. It's not a partial forgiveness. It's a complete forgiveness. And I'll just tell you this. I know people may not forgive you, and people may hold it against you, and people may talk about you, but I want you to know God always forgives. He is in the forgiving business, but what he requires of every one of us is that we would confess and we would repent, we would acknowledge the sin before him, we would change our mind and have a made up mind and serve God. And I'll just address that a little bit. You see, I think in the body of Christ, we just don't have made up minds. I think we acknowledge sin and maybe sometimes not as specific as we need to, but I think we acknowledge that sin and I think sometimes we even change our mind and we know it's wrong. But here's what I want you to see. I believe in the body of Christ. We ought to take that a step further and just make our mind up that we're going to be the people that God called us to be. We're going to live like God called us to live. We're not going to live a hypocritical life and, and say we're one thing and it not show up in the way we're living every day. I think we ought to have a made up mind and we ought to live for God and we ought to do it every single day of our life. Will there be areas in your life that you struggle? Yes. There will be, and can you call on the name of the Lord and he'll help you with that? Yes, he'll send the Holy Spirit to help you with that. If you confess it and you repent before him, he'll help you with that. Second thing I want you to know uh, about this confession and repentance thing. Confession and repentance opens the door to God's blessing in your life and my life. There are tremendous blessings that come our way when we confess and repent. Now, the devil doesn't want us to do it, and we get in this mindset sometimes that we're saved and we're going to heaven our name is written in the lamb's book of life and that's enough and i don't really have to confess my sin and there are even pastors that will preach and teach you that confession and repentance really is not necessary because god on the cross of calvary forgave sin past present and future that is absolutely true but god expects you to acknowledge and take responsibility for your sin and he expects you to change your mind about whatever's happening in your life that is contrary to his word so psalms chapter 32 is an interesting one again we go back to david here in the psalm watch what he says here blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, that sin, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over 
you. Now, boy, I love this, but I want to give you a little context for this scripture so you can understand the magnitude of what was said here. This scripture right here, David wrote this psalm, and there was a lot of things happening in David's life. It is believed that David wrote this psalm after his sin with Bathsheba. You understand that David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And not only did he commit adultery with Bathsheba, David also had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, murdered. So now he's an adulterer. He's a murderer. He commits this adultery before God, and he commits this adultery before all the soldiers and the whole community around him. He's the king. He shouldn't have been doing that, but he does that, and then he deceives and he lies about everything that he did. So I want you to look at this guy, an adulterer, a murderer. He's not, I mean, look, he would not be invited to most churches around. We wouldn't receive him. In other words, when he came in, a lot of us would talk about him and we would carry on the conversation about what he did and he would always be marked with that. But I'm coming to tell you that God will forgive you because what happened is simply this. He confessed, he acknowledged his sin before God. Remember in the last scripture, I said, Finally, David finally said, I got to get this guilt off of me. I got to get this condemnation off of me. And the Bible says that he confessed his sin and he was blessed by God. It's important that you get that because when you confess your sin, you're going to be blessed by God as well. That word blessed means a couple of things. Number one, it means he was happy. I don't know about you, but I'll take happiness over guilt any single day. I'll take happiness over condemnation. I'll take happiness over biting, uh, fighting and battling with the devil every single day about what I did or I didn't do. But the way that has to happen, you confess and you repent that sin and then you're blessed. You become a happy person and the other thing that word means is that the supernatural power of God will go before you remember what the scripture said there that when he confessed that God would show him the best pathway for his life well I've come to tell you if you will be specific with God you'll call that sin out in your life you'll get serious about that sin and you'll change your mind about it but not only change your mind make up your mind that this is not going to be a part of your life it's it's not what God wants. It's not pleasing to God. I'm serious about who I am. I'm serious about my relationship with God. I have a made up mind. I'm not going to do that anymore. Not going to be a part of my life. I'm not going to live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. I'm going to serve God. I got a made up mind. If you'll do that, God promises that you'll be a happier person and he'll guide every path. He'll open every door. The supernatural power of God will go before you. That's the importance of confession and repentance. It's there. The last thing I want you to know about that is simply this. Confession and repentance produces fruit. There ought to be fruit in our life when we confess and repent. Every one of us, it ought, in other words, there ought to be some evidence there. Let me give you the scripture for it so you can see it. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, if you translated this scripture it would really be talking about you ought to be producing fruit, which would be evidence of your confession and repentance. Too many times, I've addressed this a little bit already, too many times we, we, we kind of casually go to God and because we think it's our duty and we say, Lord, I've sinned, would you forgive me? Well, that's kind of really not good, is it? No, we ought to go to God and we ought to specifically acknowledge that thing. David said, I have rebelled against you, God, not the other person, not mankind, not myself. I rebelled against you, God, and it's wrong. And I want you to forgive me for that. You and I ought to specifically address that thing. We shouldn't be casual about it. There ought to be evidence in our life that we have made things right with God. And too often in the body of Christ, we live lives that are contrary to the word and and it creates confusion for people. It doesn't please God. And it leaves us in a state of condemnation and guilt. And it gives the devil again a foothold in our life. See, we ought to confess our sin. We ought to repent about it. And there ought to be fruit there. And the fruit I'm talking about is there ought to be evidence. The world around us ought to see the fact that we repented and we're living a right life. You should see in your own life that you've repented and made things right with God. And you're seeing the evidence of that in your life, which would be holy and righteous living. The Bible calls us to be one with God. 
there should be evidence and it should be evidence to every one of us around, evidence to all that we have made things right with God. We are holy people. We are righteous people. We're to live right. We're to be one with God and what God says is right is right and what God says is wrong is wrong. Ephesians 4, uh, and it's a pretty good long scripture, but it says a lot of things. Watch this. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature, put it off, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, now remember that word Spirit there, capital S, renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Right there it is. Now, you see, you've got to understand one thing, that only the Holy Spirit can make you who God says you are. Now, I know we are disciplined people, and some of us are very disciplined, and I know people who are more disciplined than others in particular areas of their life. And it's okay, there's some things that you can handle. There's some things that you know is wrong, you ought to stop doing it, not be a part of it, because God said put on this new life and get rid of the old life. It's real clear in Scripture right here. And the church needs to wake up to this, particularly in this last day, when the Lord is about to come back, we ought to be the people God called us to be. And he says, I want you to put off one old man that was there before you got saved. In other words, don't act like him, don't do things like him, don't approach life like he does like the way you used to, but put on the new man, which is created by God. And then trust the Holy Spirit to change some thoughts and attitudes in your life to help you change. And then he goes here, he says, we ought to live holy and righteous lives. Now, that has nothing to do with the way you dress, nothing to do with the way you fix your hair, or nothing to do with which church you go to. He's talking to Christian people right here. And he's saying, look, the word holy means one, and it means one with God. And here's simply what that means, the way you apply that to your life. God expects us to agree with him, to live like he says live, do what he says do, act like he says act, and live life according to the way he says we ought to live life. We ought to be one with him. We ought to agree with him. If we call ourselves children of God and sons and daughters of God and we accept what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and we fall in love with God, then our lives should reflect that. We ought to live right lives and be one with God. Our attitudes ought to line up with God. And here's what this scripture is really saying. Uh, we shouldn't be hypocrites. Let's go ahead and read this scripture and finish it out. So stop telling lies. There couldn't be no lies. Now, there are a lot of Christians who think that lying is okay, but Revelation 21.8 says liars are going to hell. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Well, all sin gives a foothold to the devil. And here's the principle that we ought to be taking out of this scripture right here. If we sin, whether it's anger or any other sin, we ought to be quick to confess and repent and get right with God. Don't let the sun go down. In other words, don't harbor it too long. Don't hold it in and conceal it too long because you're not gonna prosper if you do. The devil's gonna beat your brains out if you do. You're gonna have guilt and condemnation. You're gonna have all that stuff. So God says, here's the principle we ought to live by. If you sin, acknowledge it. Be specific about it. Admit it that you've just sinned against God. Change your mind about it and get a made up mind that that's not gonna be a part of your life and do it quickly before the sun ever goes down. Get rid of it so God can prosper your life from then on. If you are a thief, Quit stealing. Here's what that simply means right there. Don't steal from anybody for sure, but go to work. God doesn't like lazy people, and we're all looking for a handout these days, and we're living in a society where everybody wants something for free, and we want to stay home, and the government send us this and that. When God created us in his image and his likeness, he gave us gifts and talents and abilities, and God expects us to get off of this hind end right here and go outside and work somewhere and earn a living and honor him with the gifts and talents that he's given us and therefore he says if you don't do that you are robbing God and you're stealing from yourself you're stealing from the government you're stealing from the people around you and he says he don't like that he doesn't like anybody stealing instead use your hands for good hard work right there it is and then give generously to others in need he said if you don't work you don't eat 
Don't use foul or abusive language. And I'm telling you, Christian people have gotten to the place now where we're casually bringing in some of the language of the world and, and, and you think it's okay and we're not taking necessarily the Lord's name in vain, but we, we use abusive language and foul language and God said that shouldn't be a part of who we are. We ought to set the example. Now I can tell you, there's some things that can happen and, and it can happen pretty quickly and you gotta be careful some things will come out of your mouth. We're not perfect people. But he's talking about just choosing to lose, use foul language and abusive language. And he says that ought not to be a part of your life. Let everything you say be good and helpful. Focus on the good things and the positive things in life so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Here's what I'm telling you right now. Sin brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit. And what that does, it really stops the Holy Spirit from moving in your life. If you prosper any way in this life, you better give credit and glory to God because he opened the door. He gave you the ability, the talent to do that. He gave you the brains to do it. God is working for you whether you're serving him or not. But as a child of God, if you start doing things wrong and living contrary to God and you allow sin to come in your life, then you can believe one thing. You're bringing sorrow to the Holy Spirit. Some scriptures translate that you're quenching the Holy Spirit of God. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to live a full, abundant life. He wants you to be in good health. But when you harbor sin in your life and it's unconfessed and not repented for, you stop the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what the scripture just told us. Remember, he has identified you as his own as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. God is coming back, no question about that. Get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Boy, that's a big scripture right there. You know, I could sum that scripture up this way. Don't be a hypocrite. When you think about the word hypocrite, I want to explain to you what that means. Don't be a phony actor. That's exactly what it means when you study it out. Don't be phony. I never understood this about Christian people. Uh, before I was saved, I was probably a really good sinner. I worked on sinning. I'm not proud of that, but it's the truth. I was a good sinner. And I never had the desire to mix uh, Christianity with my sinful lifestyle. I never had that desire. When I was a sinner, I was a sinner. But when God saved me and transformed me and God was so gracious and merciful to me and forgave me of my sin, I became fully dedicated to God. That doesn't mean I was perfect, but I can tell you what it does mean. It means I was sincere with God and I had a made-up mind, I'm going to serve God. And when I stumble and fall and I get to a place... I know that I got to run to God and ask him to forgive me of that. I got to acknowledge that in my life. I got to be specific with God. I got to change my mind about it. I have a made up mind that this is not pleasing to God and it shouldn't be a part of my life. I cannot for the life of me understand why some people uh, come to church and they claim to serve the Lord, but they're living two totally different lives. I don't understand that. That's a miserable way to live. But if you'll just commit it all to God, I can tell you God will bless you. He'll guide your paths. He'll do all kinds of things for you. You'll prosper if you'll just commit to God. See, when you think about this, when we're play acting and we're being phony, there's no blessings in that. God can't bless that. And the supernatural power of God can't go before you. He can't open doors for you. He can't close doors for you. He can't do all that. Uh, you, you see, uh, you, you got to be understanding about that. God can't bless a lie. And when we're not living for God and we're saying we're living for God, we're living a lie and God can't bless that. See, God wants to go before us, but he can't go before us. He can't advise us. He can't do those things in life if we don't confess and repent. So here's what I want to say to God today. Thank you so much for the gift of confession and repentance because I know it takes guilt away I know it takes condemnation away I know it pleases God and I know it frees the Holy Spirit to work in my life and I know it's, it's the avenue that I have to take for God's blessing 
and mercy to once again work in my life. Now, here's what I want you to see. When you confess and you repent, no matter how bad it was, no matter how ugly it was, and no matter if nobody ever forgives you, I want you to hear me. God said, when you do that, I'll make a way where there seems to be no way. Some of you right now, you're living in the, in the misery of your choices. You're living in the misery of your failure. Well, I want to tell you, God doesn't want you to live there. And the devil's convinced you that you're going to be there because you've let God down and you failed God and you've done all that stuff. But I've come to tell you right now, God makes a way where there seems to be no way. The devil would convince you and other people would convince you that God is through with you and God is done with you and you've, you've gone too far. But I've come to tell you today, no, you haven't. God gave us the gift of confession and repentance and he wants us to use it so he can restore us and listen to me the beauty of, I've said it over and over and over he'll remove the guilt he'll remove the condemnation he wants the best for you the devil may have meant it for bad but God always turns it to good for his people we're going to sin and we're going to fall short of the glory of God no question about that uh, but, but God is going to work where the devil meant it for bad God is absolutely going to turn it to our good well, I'll tell you the gift of confession and repentance. What a word from the Lord today. I trust and hope that you'll share this video and you'll like this video. I trust and hope that God has spoken to you today. So I just want to pray for you. And I know you're at home and I'm asking you to bow your heads right there where you are. And I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you right now to allow the Holy Spirit as he's moving in this message right now. I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you sins in your life, places you've disappointed God, places you failed. Right now, I want you to ask God to point them out to you. And then I want you to do exactly what I've laid out. Do exactly what David did. Do exactly what we're all supposed to be doing every single day of our life. Lord, this particular sin is in my life. Whatever that sin is, name it before God. And I know it's wrong, God. I'm acknowledging that it's contrary to your word. I'm acknowledging it's not supposed to be in my life. And I'm acknowledging that I have sinned against you only. I'm changing my mind today, God. I'm, I'm making my mind up today that I'm not going to live this way anymore. Now, Holy Spirit, would you take this out of my life? Would you help me not to live this way anymore? Would you help me please God? Would you strengthen me spiritually? Would you help me to avoid this in my life again? If you'll do that, God will set you free today. He'll begin to guide your pathway again. He'll begin to show you mercy. He'll begin to work in your life. He'll begin to prosper you. And look, you'll be a happier person if you do that. Maybe you're listening to me today and you're not saved. Maybe you don't even know the Lord. And maybe there are things in your life that you need to deal with right now. Well, you can do that right now, and I'll tell you how easy that is. I want you to know that God loves you, and God died for you. He wants you to live a, an abundant life and a good life. He wants to be a part of your life. But you have to accept Him, and some of you have put it off for a long time. You've heard it, and you've heard it, and you've heard it. And you're, you're just tired today of your life. You're just sick and tired of, of what you live with this last year, maybe the last months or whatever, and you want to make things right with the Lord. Well, today is your day. It's a real easy deal. All you got to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here's how that goes. You just accept the fact that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. And a sinner is simply someone that's separated from God. You admit the fact that you are a sinner and need a Savior. You believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior, that He died on the cross of Calvary for you. He was God's Son. He died. He paid your sin debt. He spent three days in the grave, and He arose on the third day, and He's seated at the right hand of the Father praying for you right now. You simply believe that He paid your sin debt and that He made a way for you to get back to God. You put your faith in that. You believe that, and then you commit your life to Him. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity, will come in and he will help you live this life that glorifies God. He will explain all the things that you're confused about. And he'll help you with that if you'll just do those three things today. Maybe you're watching me and you think you're saved, but you really can't think of a time in your life where you really uh, can remember that moment in your life when you did that. Well, you can do that today. If you'll do those three steps, I promise you God will do a great work in your life. 
I trust that God has spoken to you today. May God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And may he give you his peace that passes all understanding. Would you share the video? And Would you like the video? And would you put the gospel of Jesus Christ out there? Again, the last week of our 21-day fast, let's dig down deep and let's serve God. Let's seek God with all of our heart and watch what God is going to do this year in your life and in this church. God bless you. Hope to see you next Sunday.